Yes. How many ate too much? Or oh, just one. <laughs> so, I want to talk to you today about one word. I believe that after the sermon, we're going to share communion together. Is that correct? Okay. I want to talk to you about one word. It may be the greatest word in the dictionary. It may be the most beautiful word in the dictionary. It may be the most powerful word in the dictionary. In the English, it's the word grace. Everybody say grace. Grace. No, no, you didn't say it loud enough. Grace. Grace. Now, I believe that this is the Bahasa. Is, I hope this is true. <laughs> yes. Is this right? Yes. yes. So you say it's Kasi Karunia. Yes. Yeah. Is that, how do you say it? Kasi Karunia. Kasi Karunia, that's what I said. Yeah. Yeah. Grace. <laughs> Grace is the longest word in the English dictionary. <laughs> sure, it's, no, it's the longest. Because Grace began before time was created. And it lasts into the future when time will be no more. Because it was in grace that God called us, it's in grace that He saved us, and it's grace that will keep us forever. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Yes. We sing amazing grace. We, uh, the Bible talks about abundant grace. That word means plentiful, amazing, abundant. It is divine. One of the names for God is that He is the God of all grace. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad that it doesn't say He's the God of all anger? <laughs> He's the God of all judgment. He's the God who is waiting to punish you. No. He's the God of all grace. Kasi Karunia. Uh, uh, my wife and I have been to Poland many times. The Polish language is very strange. Uh, I find that Bahasa is much easier to follow than <laughs> Polish. But the Polish word for... Shall I tell you what the Polish word for yes. grace is? Waska. Yes. Waska. Everybody say Waska. Waska. It sounds like a dog. Waska. Waska. <laughs> I think if we ever get a dog, we will call him Waska. <laughs> the Greek word for grace is charis. We get the word charismatic from it. But what does grace mean? How do we understand grace? How can we define grace? And so to do that, we are going to go on a journey. Are you ready? Fasten your seatbelts. There is a life jacket under your seat. You know, if the oxygen mask comes on, just fix it firmly. Uh, and uh, so are you ready for a little journey that we're going to discover what grace means? The first journey uh, is to um, an accountant's office. Do we have any accountants here? Anybody an accountant? No. Uh, this is not an earthly accountant. It is heaven's accountant. And there the accountant sits behind the desk. There's a computer, a keyboard, and there's me sitting on the opposite side of the desk. And he explains to me, Sir, your account is in trouble. In fact, you are totally bankrupt. Oh, now this is heaven's accountant. He's not talking about my finances. He's not talking about my bank account. He's talking about my spiritual state. And he said, there are things that you have done. And there are things that you have said. And there are things that you've thought. And everything about you, we've recorded it all here. And you are seriously in debt. How are you today? I am so glad you're here. I've got a word for you. Are you ready? Yes. Cassie Karunia. Oh, you don't know what he means. Oh, 
that was very good. Somebody <laughs> tell me. Somebody, what does it mean? Cassie Karunia. Grace. Grace. So here I am. I'm sitting in front of the accountant. He's examined my life. And he said, Mr. Griffiths, you are seriously in debt. In fact, you are hopelessly bankrupt. I say, but what about my assets? He said, what assets are those? He sa I said, well, I was born in England, and that must count for something. And I live in Australia, that's a good place, that must count for something. My father was a pastor all of my life, that must count for something. And I'm married to a beautiful wife, that must count for something. And I've never stolen anything to my mind, knowledge, and I've never killed anybody, and I always keep within the speed limits, and I'm, I'm a good man. And the accountant said this to me. He said, none of those things are worth anything. Your debts are great. Your assets are zero. You have a serious problem. How are you going to pay this debt? Remember, this is not an earthly accountant. This is heaven's accountant. I'm sitting there thinking, what shall I do? When into the room walks the man from Galilee. Who's the man from Galilee? Jesus. I didn't hear what you said. Jesus. Into the room walks Jesus. I'm not sure if he has a carpenter's apron on or a preacher's coat, but he walks in and the accountant recognizes him and uh, he says to the accountant, I want you to conduct two transfers. He said, certainly, sir. The first transfer is to transfer this man's debt to my account. With a few, you know, instructions on the keypad, suddenly all of my debts have gone. They've been transferred from me to Jesus. Then, he said, the second transfer is I want you to transfer my righteousness to his account. There's a few more strokes on the keyboard, and there is my account all debts are paid. And now I actually have a credit balance of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And that is grace. But show me the text, would you please? This is uh, 2 Corinthians 5.21. God made him. Who's that? Well, he tells us who it is. God made him who had no sin. So who's this? God made Jesus to be sin for us, so that we, so that in Him, we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. All debts are paid. I'm in a terrible position. My debts are unpayable. I have no assets, but Jesus takes all of my debts and then transfers to me all of His righteousness this is grace. All debts are paid. That should make you shout hallelujah. Amen. I think we should read this together. I think we should speak it out so our own ears can hear us. Are you ready? Here we go. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. All debts have been paid. That's grace. From the, uh, from the accountant's office, we go to the laundry. Do you know what a laundry is? What's uh, you know, a place where people take their clothes to be dry cleaned? Or uh, what's, what's the bahasa for laundry or dry cleaners? Um, laundry. <laughs> what, what? Laundry. Same. Laundry. Yeah. Oh, now I know another one. That's the word. So now we go to the laundry. And as we walk into the shop, there is a counter and there is a young woman there. She is a school teacher. She is holding in her arms her most precious possession. 
It is a beautiful white coat made of the finest wool. Maybe it's uh, llama wool or angora, or, but it, it's a beautiful, beautiful coat. And she says to the man in the laundry, I have a problem. Uh, sometime at school, I have sat down in, on a chair and there was ink on the chair and it has stained my coat. She shows him the back of the coat and right in the middle of the back is a large dark blue stain. She said, I think it's ink. I've done everything I could. I googled, you know, removing ink stains. I asked Siri. Have you all met Siri? Siri, how do I move ink stains? And, and I went to all these sites on the web and I did everything in my power to do it. And the stain did not get removed. In fact, I think it got worse. She showed the stain to the laundry man, the dry cleaner. And uh, she said to him, I want you to do whatever it takes to remove the stain. When I return, I don't want to see the stain. Do you understand? Yeah. The lady went back seven days later. She said, how did you get up with my coat? Oh, he said, the stain's gone. She was so pleased. He went to into the back of the shop and brought out this wonderful blue coat. She said, that, that's not my coat. My coat is white. Oh, I, I assure you, that's your coat. No, 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 no. It's a white. No, he said, you asked us to remove the stain. We tried everything. Every known means, every known way that we remove stains and it didn't go. So we thought you asked us to do whatever we could to hide the stain. So we dyed the coat the same color. <laughs> she was heartbroken. Do you know that human nature when it cannot overcome problems, changes the rules so the rules don't, can't get broken. So we have to change our language. Uh, well, stealing is no longer stealing. It is misappropriation. Uh, it is uh, wealth equalization. We, we can't remove the stain, so let's change life so that people with sexual problems well they are just making lifestyle choices sin well there's not really such a thing as sin it's just our weakness and what we do is that we change the color of the whole coat and we cover over our sin and our stains into the laundry came the man from Galilee. What's his name? Jesus. Jesus. He comes to the young lady, puts his hand on this stained and dyed coat, and as he touches it, all things become new. You might say to me, oh, Jeremy, this is a bit of magic. No. In 2 Corinthians 5.17 it says that whoever is in Christ they are brand new people. Old things are gone. Everything becomes new. Amen. And when Jesus touches our life, uh, look at the next verse. It, it tells us that all stains are removed. This is 1 John 1, 7. That the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Our sin has gone. It hasn't been covered over. The rules haven't been changed. Words haven't been altered. Hey, we came with a stained life. But Jesus touched us. And through His blood, all stains have been removed. Amen. Isn't that good news? Yes. That's grace. For all people, for all sin. For all time, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us. 
Say those words with me. All sin, all, sin, all, time, all time, all people, all people. The blood of Jesus. That is grace. We need to read this verse together. Big voice. Just give a little cough to clear your throat. You know, get, get your neck ready because we're now going to wake the people upstairs. Are you ready? The blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. All. All people, all time, all sin. Now this time we're going to read it and make it personal. The blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses Put your hand over your heart and say, Me! Are you ready? We're going to read it together. The blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses me from all sin. All people, all time, all sin. And that's grace. You see, there is one cleaning agent. There is one soap. There's one detergent that will work on every stain. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. When I was a Bible college student, it was a residential college. And this was many, many years ago. It was like 1850 or something. It was, it was a really long time ago. And the college had very strict rules. And one of the rules was... You were not allowed to buy anything on a Sunday. Now don't ask me why they did that, but that was a rule. And uh, the cook didn't work on Sunday, and so we just had cold food from the day before. And when you are 20 years of age, you are hungry. I mean, even after dinner, you're hungry. You know, when you have your dinner, you say, you know, what's for supper? So, so on Sundays, it was a terrible day. <laughs> And we went as a, you know, maybe uh, six students went to a, uh, a church to preach. And on the way home, did somebody say KFC? <laughs> and so we stopped at KFC. We got one of the, I, I know I bought a little lunch pack, you know, two pieces of chicken. 17 spices and herbs, secret remedy and recipe and chips. And, and I put... The, the packet, the, the box of the chicken on my lap, on my knee. I really enjoyed the chicken. And when I got back to the college, guess what? There was some KFC chicken grease on my suit. It was the only suit I had, and there was a big round patch of grease. Well, I did everything I could to get rid of the, the stain. You know, if you put um, uh, a particular type of paper on there and iron it, if you leave it out in the sun, if you wash it with, uh, you know, grease removing soap, if you, uh, there were all sorts of ideas. <laughs> There's something in the Bible that says, be sure your sin will find you out. And you know, don't, don't buy anything on Sunday, KFC, you know. I, I applied all these materials to remove the stain. And guess what? It did remove the stain and left a hole. <laughs> and that's what happens in life. When we try to do what we can to cleanse our lives, it leaves us empty and with a hole. But the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, has cleansed me from all sin. That's grace. All debts are paid. All stains are removed. From there we move to the courtroom. Uh, this is not an earthly courtroom. This is heaven's courtroom. The architecture is magnificent. There is a, a gallery for people and there are millions upon millions of people watching. And there is, a, on the bench, there is the judge of all the earth. God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. He is the judge. Over there it is the prosecutor's table. And he sits with his papers and he's getting ready. And when I look to the other side, the defense table, I'm sitting there. I'm on trial. 
This is heaven's court, and I'm being charged. There is nobody sitting next to me. The judge says, uh, Is the prosecutor ready? I am, sir. When he looks, there's no one sitting next to me. He says, Where is your defense counsel? There is a gasp from the gallery as into the courtroom walks the man from Galilee. Uh, who's that? Jesus. Into the courtroom comes, and he comes and sits next to me with this wonderful warm smile. And he says, it's going to be all right. The judge brings down his hammer and declares, the court is now in session. Prosecutor, would you bring your first witness? Into the courtroom slithers the serpent, the devil, the enemy of our soul, the one who has trapped us and tempted us and tricked us. But even as he approaches the witness box, Jesus stands to his feet and declares to God, this one is a liar. He is the father of lies. He's a liar from the beginning. Not one word of what he says is true. And even as Jesus speaks these words, he then adds one more word, go. And the snake, the serpent, slithers away. The prosecutor is disappointed. He thought that the devil would be a great witness against me. But then he lists all these people, all these names, and they are my friends and my family and my work colleagues. And he's inviting them to come into the witness box to declare what sort of person I am. And I know that they know me. I know I've hurt some of them. I know that I've disappointed some of them. I know that some of them don't really like me. And this is their moment to get their revenge. But then Jesus stands. And he declares, let one of you, let the first one of you who has committed no sin be the first to speak. And then he knelt down and started to write on the floor of the courtroom. And one by one they left the room until there was no one there to accuse them. The prosecutor is even more distraught. He then says, I have a final witness. And he points at me and says, Jeremy, go stand in the witness box. And I know that the things that I've done and said and thought will condemn me. I am now under scrutiny. But even as I stand in the witness box, Jesus walks across, stands behind me wraps his coat of righteousness around me. And all my fears and all my guilt and all my sense of low worth disappears in a moment. And I have nothing to say, nothing to confess. The judge then says, well, defense counsel, have you got witnesses? And Jesus calls the blood of the Lamb. And the blood of the Lamb begins to speak to the room, declaring that through what Jesus did at Calvary, His blood has cleansed us. And then He invites the Word of God to come and declares the promises that offer forgiveness and salvation. And then He invites the Holy Spirit, who I know is my very best friend, and He only speaks well of me. And finally, Jesus says to the judge, I'm now calling on you to testify. And he brought back to my mind the parable of the prodigal son, who when he came back to the father, the father came running to him, wrapped his arms around him, kissed him, put a coat upon him, put a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet, and declared, my son was dead, but is now alive. And in heaven's courtroom, every accusation was silenced. Then the judge brings down his hammer. This is the next verse. And it says in Romans 8.1, 
Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is grace. All accusation silence. Look at that little word, now. It means now and from now on. It doesn't just mean this moment. It means every moment in the future. There is, therefore, there is now, today, tomorrow, the future. There is no. The word no means zero. It means nil. There's a word called zilch. Have you ever heard the word zilch? It means an American word and it means zero. There's nothing. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We're going to read this together. You need to emphasize the words now and no and in. Are you ready? Here we go. Therefore, oh no, no, we, we got to wake them up upstairs. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Grace, all stains removed, all debts paid, all accusations silenced. From the courtroom, we move to the prison house. And we discover that you and I are in prison. As I thought about this, I thought, what sort of prison is it? Is it a prison house of sin? Because we're all trapped with sin. Is it a prison house of selfishness? That's the root of sin. And we're all trapped by selfishness. Is it a prison of addictions, where we are trapped by sins and habits that have got us held. What sort of prison house is it? And I looked around and I realized that it was a prison house of religion. Listen to me very carefully. Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Now let me say that to you again in case you didn't hear it. Christianity is not a religion. It is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Look at me. Religion climbs a ladder of good works to heaven. It's the stairway to heaven. The problem is, it doesn't reach there. Have you ever been to a pet shop and see those little mice that they sell. And usually in the little cage or glass container, there is a wheel. And there'll be a little mouse on the wheel, running, 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 running. And he's running so hard, and he's getting nowhere. You ever seen that? Yes. That's religion. Religion climbs the ladder that doesn't reach the top. Religion is on the treadmill, on the wheel, that's doing everything it can. What have I got to do to be saved? What rules have I got to follow? What regulations must I obey? What have I got to do, 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 do? And we end up in the dungeon of sin and of religion. And it's a dark, dark, I'm sorry it's a long verse. Are you ready? Here we go. So... When we come to not, you've got to shout it out. And when it comes to by faith, shout it out. Are you ready? Clear your throat. Loosen your neck and your shoulders. Take a deep breath. Here we go. A person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we have put our faith in Jesus Christ. That we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. This is grace. All debts paid, all stains removed, all accusations 
silence and all chains are broken. If you are in a prison house of religion, let the man from Galilee come and he will set you free. Hallelujah. So, yes, hallelujah. <laughs> so we've been to the accountants and discovered all debts are paid. We've been to the laundry and discovered all stains are cleansed. We've been to the courthouse and the judge has said no condemnation or accusations silenced. Now we've come to the prison house and the man from Galilee has broken every chain. There is one more visit we need to make. Are you ready? Are your seatbelts still fancy? Are you okay? We're nearly there. We now move to the palace. It's a splendid palace. It's in Jerusalem. It is King David's palace. He's been reigning as king for maybe 12, maybe 15 years. And then he remembers a covenant. A covenant that he made with Jonathan. Do you remember that Saul's son, Jonathan, and David were very good friends? And uh, Jonathan was the prince. He'd be the next king. But Samuel had anointed David to be king. And these two young men both knew that there would be a struggle between the house of Saul and the house of David. And so these two young men agreed. They made a covenant. Everybody say covenant. Uh, an agreement. that They might have sacrificed an animal. There would have been shedding of blood as they made the covenant. And this was the covenant. David, if I am king, I will care for your family. David said, if I am king, I will care for your family. There came a battle when King Saul and Prince Jonathan were both killed. And that started a fierce civil war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And, and, and slowly, David's family overcame. David's tribe overcame. Judah overcame Benjamin. And all of Saul's family was killed. Twelve, fifteen years later, David remembers the covenant. Everybody say covenant. covenant. He remembers the covenant. I'll look after your family. And he says to his advisors, is there anyone left of Saul's family that I can show kindness to? They did some research and they said, yes, yes. There is one son of Jonathan left. <laughs> but you don't have to worry, king. He's not a threat. Uh, when he tried to escape, his nurse carrying him as a child dropped him. We don't know how, whether it was a spinal problem, but ever since then, he's been crippled and his feet and his ankles, he can't walk. He's lost all his family possessions. He's lost the land, their home, and now he's living in Lodabar. Where? Lodabar. Where on earth is Lodabar? Oh, it's the other side of Sejuna. It's on the way to WA. It's out in the... It's not the bush. It's the outback. It's the desert. It's remote. It's a long way. He's lost everything, King. You don't have to worry about him. He's living out there with the rebels and, and the, you know, the, the people that society doesn't want. Just leave him. He's no threat. David says, Go and get him. Can you hear the thunder of the hooves of the horses as the soldiers ride into Lodabar? Mephibosheth! We're looking for Mephibosheth! When you're a cripple, you can't run. When you're in a small village, you can't hide. And they find Mephibosheth 
and they drag him back to Jerusalem. They prop him up in front of King David. And this is what Mephibosheth says. These are the words out of the Bible. My Lord, what do you want with a dead dog like me? Those are his words. And David replied with this. Mephibosheth, there is a covenant I made with your father. And your name is in the covenant. So today... Everything you've lost, I am restoring. Your home and your land is given back to you. And quite obviously, you will not be able to work. So that man there used to work for your granddad, Saul. He will now work for you and his sons and all their servants. There are actually 35 people who will now work for you and make sure that your farm is restored. Everything lost is restored. And you are one skinny guy. It looks like you haven't eaten for months. So from now on, from this day on, you will sit at my table and eat my food. Do you know what that is? That is grace. When we are mentioned in a covenant, we are the beneficiaries of a covenant that we have nothing to do with. And everything lost is restored. And our position is totally reversed. We go from Lodabar to Jerusalem. We go from a place where there are rebels to a place where there are royalty. We move from sin to being saints. I'm talking about you, Saint Mickey, Saint Jeremy. Now that has a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Saint Paul. What's your name? Christopher. Christoph. Saint Christoph. Look at the next verse. All positions are reversed. This is John 5.24. This is Jesus speaking. I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Has eternal life. And will not be condemned. But has, what's the next word? Crossed, Crossed over from death to life. From Lodabar to Jerusalem, from, from rebels to royalty, from sin to saint, all positions are reversed. He doesn't do anything. All he has to do is enjoy what the covenant has given him. And that is grace. Amen. Hallelujah. Look at the next slide. Grace. Everybody say the Bahasa. Are you ready? Say, say it again. What does it mean? Grace. It means all deaths. All states. All accusations silenced. All chains broken. And all positions reversed. Hallelujah. That's why we sing. Amazing grace. Whoa. My chains are gone. My stains are cleansed. My debts are paid. The judge declares that I am righteous. And now I sit at the king's table. And he provides everything I need. Whoopee. If I could jump, I'd jump. So, so I'm, I'm jumping right now. I can't get my feet off the ground, but I'm jumping. I would like to jump so high I could tap the roof. Uh, hey, why? Debts paid, stains removed, accusations silenced, chains broken, positions reversed. That's grace. Yeah. Yes. Today, we come to the king's table. Today the king says, from now on, you will sit at my table 
and eats my food. The strange thing about this is that this is a feast. <laughs> a feast. A little wafer and a little glass of juice. Why? We'll, we'll be hungry before we swallow it. Oh no. What this table means will sustain us forever. That the, the wafer that speaks of the body of Christ and the juice that speaks of His blood remind us that debts have been paid, stains have been cleansed, the accusation is silent, the chains are broken, and now we sit at the King's table. Ah, oh, but you have to be holy to do this. We are holy in Jesus. Oh, but you've got to do good things. If we are, we're on that wheel, the man's chasing itself. But he set us free from the prison house of religion. Oh, but I've done things that I can't forgive myself for. The good news is that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, has cleansed me. He removes every stain. <laughs> Debts paid, chains broken, stains cleansed. The good news is that your name is in the covenant. What do you want with me, a dead dog, said Mephibosheth. Ah, oh, there is a covenant that you are a beneficiary of. Let me tell you that this is a covenant. This is the agreement that Jesus made with us. This body was broken for us. His blood was shed for us. Not against us, but for us. And we are in the covenant, not because of who we are, but because of who He is. Our name's in the covenant. Hallelujah.